Hello, everyone. Good morning. Kind of early, huh? <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I'll say first of all that my most important identifier is Malia's papa. When Malia, she's my eight year old daughter, was about two weeks old, her mother put her on my chest and she just kind of snuggled up put her head right in the air. It was, it was almost like she was a little puppy. And I just at that point fell deeper in love than I'd ever been with anything. And I realized at that point, when she was 20, I wanted to be able to look her in the eyes and say, I did everything that I could, given the situation that we're in. So when I heard about the, the reactor problems in Japan and the meltdown, you know what the first thing that went through my mind was, right? I was concerned about my daughter. That was the first thought. And being a, a single father, separate, divorced and separated from, from her mother, added this extra layer of complication because <clears throat> well, I'm walking through Berkeley Bowl and I see a pr professor from San Francisco State University who I've known for a long time and she's not She's, I guess she's a little radical in some ways. She's not as radical as probably I might be. But she's telling me, okay, well, the fallout it may come here and you need to get some miso soup. You need to get some kelp. You need to get, you know, all these things that have a lot of iodine in them because you need to make sure that your daughter has, has these things and is eating these things to protect her because children are more susceptible. And... The, the thing that went through my mind at the time is, yeah, I'll do that. I'm getting the miso soup. I'm getting some from for here, and I'm going to send some home with her mother. But just the whole thing of, of not being with her mother, and we're in communication and collaboration in a really great way, but stuff like peak oil and climate crisis, that's what contributed to the breaking up of the marriage. So I wasn't <laughs> sure how she would react when I said, oh yeah, we need Malia to be eating miso soup every day. So there's just, you know, a little apprehension about that. And, and I had the conversation with her and she said, okay. She, she, she was concerned as well. And I was really heartened by that, that it was a really easy conversation to have with her. And there's miso soup in Castro Valley. There's miso soup in Oakland. And uh, I'm glad there's a ton of miso soup in Japan. You know, our hearts and best wishes and solidarity, of course, go out to the folks in Japan. And my big hope is, of course, minimum uh, human and ecological damage to, for Japan, and of course, uh, as well for us, but at the same time that this becomes a catalytic moment where we create some new openings in terms of the conversations for local clean energy. And I see the big possibility for this because there are new allies that are here today, there are new allies that are planning rallies there are new allies that are now saying we don't want PG&E to be able to relicense the Diablo Canyon power plant which is less than a couple miles from a fault that we we just found that out in 2008 we don't want that to happen for them to be able to relicense for another 30 years because we know there's a big one that's going to be coming to this state, and we don't know where it's going to hit. There have been a number of us who have been talking about nuclear for, for years, and we've been saying, you know, it's not cost effective. It takes way too long. It uses too much water. It's a possible terrorist play, attack. And it's also could be a problem if there's an earthquake. We didn't know when when... Things were going to happen, of course. 
and they have happened. They haven't happened here yet. So for our children, for ourselves, it seems like an imperative to make sure that we're not going to set ourselves up for having this technology continue another 30 years when there are so many amazing alternatives. Sun, wind, petals, waves, distributed, decentralized energy options. We can do them and they will never melt down. So I'm really pleased to be here with all of you talking about the solution. One of the important pieces of the puzzle for us to transition to a new way of living on this planet. I've been the coordinator of the Local Clean Energy Alliance for about three years now. It's an alliance of over 70 nonprofits and local businesses. There's even one government agency <laughs> that joined the Alliance earlier this year as well. We, you can go to the website and find out about all the members. I'm really proud to be joined here by a number of people from our steering committee. Could the steering committee members please stand up? Christian Swin, Aaron Lamer, Rory Cox, Al Weinrub, Rose Yee, Larry Chang, he's in the back, okay, and Zigum Kabir, okay, so these are the people that have joined me, in, the, in this journey to popularize the movement for local clean energy here in the Bay Area, our priorities are energy reduction, so not just energy efficiency where we're increasing the extent to which the things we do are efficient. No, we want to actually begin to reduce the amount of energy that we're using. The other thing is local decentralized uh, power and local control of our energy systems. So I'd like to welcome you all here and thank you for being here. If there's going to be some amazing things that happen today, then I'm going to just give up the podium for Al. Thank you so much, Al, for being the coordinator. <laughs>